Life isn't perfect, and neither are we. Nope. But we know how to face our fears. And have some fun. And talk about all the messiest things of life. Like the messiest things. <laughs> get connected to yourself, get connected to others, and get connected to the life right in front of you. This is The Connected Life with Justin and Abby. That's me. That's you. And you. Hey, Connected Life peeps. We got a really great episode for oh, you today. so good. This episode was pre-recorded that we're about to share with you. We originally were going to um, have... <laughs> what? I'm laughing about what you're about to say. We were originally going to have a Restoring Sexuality series. Yeah, like a seven or eight part series about sexuality. Mm -hmm, which we have all those put together. But that started... Uh, we recorded back in March. Right before Corona. February, March. February. Somewhere February. In, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, in February. Corona hit and it felt like this, this is... This might be too intense. Uh -huh, for everything that's going on in the Let's world. Let's not open up everybody's problems all at the same time mm -hmm. as the world going through well, a pandemic. Well, they're all being trapped together already. Yeah, totally. <laughs> inside of homes. Um, but what we wanted to do is kind of begin to pepper yep. the sexuality series throughout mm -hmm. uh, the connected life moving forward. So today we have an incredible guest that you're going to be listening to, Paul Young, author of The Shack, mm -hmm. such a good friend of ours. And he's going to dive into his story of some of his uh, childhood trauma within mm -hmm. sexuality, uh, the effects of that long term on his life, and the redemption and restoration story mm -hmm. that led him uh, into a place of healing on the other side of it. It's really powerful. It's our hopes in um, the many episodes that are contained within this series as we pepper them throughout, that people begin to uh, find healing inside of their sexuality and mm -hmm. also find new perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, we want to see the world get restoration in this area. One of the things that we know that when it comes to the sexuality conversation is that it stirs up a lot of emotions, especially and, and pain and trying to figure out how, how do I heal from this? What do I do? We know that there's a lot of conversation that we're going to have about pornography and childhood, uh, childhood experiences, mm -hmm. as well as broken judgments that we have against sexuality and also adult experiences that we've yeah. had. And we just know that it stirs up a lot for you guys. And we want you to be able to have have access to healing inside of that. And so this year coming up in 2021, as we've been talking about on this podcast, is Living Fully Alive. And in Living Fully Alive, we help equip people with the tools to really understand and have self-awareness of what's going on inside, but not only understand it, but then know what to do with it mm -hmm. and how to walk that process out to where it's not just oh, I felt pain, but now I know what to do with my pain mm -hmm. and I feel equipped and I feel empowered with that to not only help myself, but now I have tools and keys to help other people mm -hmm. on that journey as well. And that that is designed in a way that helps you actually create a community, a culture around you. It's not just one individual, but it's about creating a culture and a lifestyle within that culture of thriving. So many people I've worked with around sexuality issues and they all think it's about sexuality issues and it's really about pain and pain management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every addiction, sexuality, alcohol, shopping, drugs, eating, every addiction is based on the same root, which is I don't know what to do with my pain. I, I need to stuff it. I need to avoid it. I need to cover over it. And so I remember having this client that I was working with to overcome porn. And I was like, we're just going to work on you learning how to face pain. We didn't even talk about sexuality. Right. It was just learning how to face pain and, and working through the pain that he'd been avoiding. And he thought that that was the dumbest way to attack the porn issue, but it was the fastest way. We walked through learning how to process his pain and all of a sudden he was able to get free. He'd been trying the same method over and over and over again of just trying to white knuckle it or shove it down or push through it instead of actually what is going on underneath the sexuality issue. How do I get healing for that? And then when, once that is gone, you, you aren't driven. You're not fighting it all of the time. I always picture it like a people have a tree with oranges and they're trying to pick all the oranges off so that it never has oranges instead of just cho chopping the tree down. If you actually take time to deal with the pain, you don't have to manage all of the symptoms. So, so that's what living fully alive is. Yeah. And so you've got until uh, December 30th, 31st, January 1st to sign up for that. Yeah. So less January. than a month. Mm -hmm. We'd recommend jumping on that right now. Mm -hmm. Before all the Go spots to Justin fill up and on that. Com. And without further ado, enjoy the episode. 
Paul Young on our podcast today, and he is one of the most incredible humans and has been so transformative in me and Justin's life personally. Mm-hmm. Not to mention in so many people's lives because of the books that he has written that have radically changed how people see God. Yep. Uh, A couple of those books are The Shack, Eve, and Crossroads. And he's also written Lies We Believe About God, which I think shook some major foundations for people in their journey. He is delightful and so creative and um, we're excited to have him on here. This is the Restoring Sexuality series. Uh-huh. And in this series, we're talking about um, really facing the parts of our sexuality that feel broken and being able to um, get healing and wholeness and hope. Like One thing that I want people to walk away with is there's pretty much hope mm-hmm. for anyone, no matter where you are at. So, Paul, I thought we'd just jump in and have you share a little bit about your story so they know, oh, he can relate <laughs> to me. Oh, he oh. can relate. Yeah. He's not in an ivory tower. <laughs> <laughs> so, first, let me say thank you. I'm so honored to be with you. And uh, every conversation I have with you is a two-way street. I'm, it's it's beneficial for me. Mm. So, thank you. Yeah. And um, – so, uh, my story, missionary kid, preacher's kid, modern evangelical, angry God, mm-hmm. angry father, um, sexual abuse uh, in, in on the mission field and then in missionary boarding school, um, uh, really believed that I had to die before any wholeness was possible mm-hmm. on a good chunk of my life. Mm. And, uh, and and you mean fact, like it, when I get to heaven, that's when there's hope? Yeah, for me? because because you know you struggle with all the broken parts of you for so long, and and you just think like I'm getting nowhere here. Yeah, you know I'm I'm just going in circles, or or especially when you when it ropes into an addiction like a porn addiction or something like that. You know, yeah. and uh, and. Those of us who have been broken as children, a lot of us, uh, shame and fear become the basic motivators of our lives. Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was true for me. Um, so that's where the shack imagery comes from, right? Uh, the shack represents the place you're stuck. It's your own soul. It's your own mm. broken heart. And it's the own, your own house on the inside. And, um, and some people get good help building the house on the inside. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and I'm thrilled when I when I hear about that. Um, but for for a lot of us, that's just simply not true. You mean like we some people not, have parents that can who actually affirm them and encourage them yeah. and see them, mm-hmm. right? And um, you know my my parents were broken already, mm-hmm. you know, especially my dad in many in many respects. You know his. His father had beat the humanity out of him before mm. I ever showed up. But when you're a child, you don't know that. Right. And so you you tend to, especially if you're inside some theological framework, uh, religious Christianity or something, you know, you tend to project your image of your father onto the face of God. And if you've got a theology that matches that, that mm. just, you know, makes it all the worse. It's really debilitating. And, very debilitating. I and think so, that it's uh, yeah. one of, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in because this okay. is one of the things you've said that has so transformed my life. I, I quote it pretty much constantly where you say it took you how many years to wipe, 50 the, years. To wipe the face? 50 years to wipe the face of my father off the face of God. And for me, the reason why that's so important is I also had to go on that process and I actually had a great dad, but still... Even good dads can contribute to you seeing the father through wrong lenses. Yeah. And it's been the the pain that happens in someone's soul when they think that the God who created them hates them or or, or is disgusted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. I, there was a gal uh, and she's uh, grew up in the same denominational history as I did. And um I'm, I'm digging way back because this is back in 2008, I think, or 2000, yeah, 2008. And um, and she said, you know, she said two profound things when she wrote me this email. And she said, you know, I grew up and I didn't really know the difference between 
what the dif- real difference between God and Satan was, except with mm-hmm. Satan, I always knew where I stood. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Right? Yeah. And the other thing she said was, you know, I wasn't afraid to die because she was quite suicidal. You know, she said, I wasn't afraid to die. I was just terrified of seeing the look of disgust on his face when we mm. finally met. Mm, that makes me want to cry. Oh, me too. Hearing that. Oh, me too. And partly because been there, right? Yeah, totally. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, God, and, and we're talking more God the Father. Like God the Father was the, the darkness behind Jesus, you know, <laughs> Gan- Gandalf yep. with bad attitude. God. <laughs> uh-huh. Totally. Uh-huh. And so people say, why did you make God a large black African-American woman? Well, I'm trying to get as far away from Gandalf with a bad attitude <laughs> as I can get. You know? Right. <laughs> uh-huh. Totally. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I- imagery never was intended to define God anyway, thankfully. But yeah. there are little windows through which we see. But the clearest presentation of the character and nature of God is Jesus, and then we didn't believe him. Mm -hmm. I mean, we believed Jesus about himself, but we didn't believe Jesus about God the Father. Right. And, you know. Yeah, because we're very confused. Okay, Jesus is good. He's a savior. But he's still. compassionate. He heals. He delivers. So, if you've yeah. seen me, you've seen the Father. I doubt it. No, that's not no, God. No, no, the no. Father can't be no. that good. No. 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 So you know, Jesus actually, in our theology, came to save us from God the Father, right. uh-huh. which was really devastating because that immediately creates um, fear because fear is always based on an impending or a perception of a threat. Yeah. You know. And so when when God, as the one who supposedly loves you but is so distant and he can't look on sin, so why wouldn't you turn away? Because that's what you do from a threat, yeah. a perceived threat. And yeah. it's and it's even worse. Like this idea of this God is even more painful when you have a history that's riddled with already. Um, really destructive experiences that happened to you that you had no control over. So here we have even your childhood. You talk yeah. about the sexual abuse, and now you have, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of littered sexual abusive moments that happened maybe. I don't know what that looked like in your childhood, and you can talk about some of that. But now all of a sudden, oh, I am completely disgusting and worthless, and there was nothing that I did to make it happen. It just is now so based on this imagery of who God the Father is and what his feeling about sin happens to be. Sure. And so you get the whisper of accusation from from the time you're really, really small, yeah. right? And, and, and it's one thing for abuse to whisper to you that you're, you're just a piece of shit, you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's another thing for your dad to whisper that to you by beating yeah. the crap out of you, right? Yeah. And, and then you, you go to boarding school and the big boys come and molest you at night and you find out that if you want to belong, you have to mm-hmm. exchange it for part of your 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 being right and and you have to kind of take the little the little boy that had a possibility of existing and and just make him disappear and you become you become a mirror to the to the person who's in front of you 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 don't exist as a real person yeah and um and so that's where the facade imagery imagery comes from right yeah shack is where you which is your own broken place. That's where you hide all your addictions and, and, and your secrets. Mm-hmm. And yeah. because, because fear also drives you into hiding, and, which is all Genesis, yeah. yeah. And uh, the perception of a threat. And, um, and, and here you are, you know, you, you build the facade, you can paint as fast as you can pick up people's expectations, and you live from the outside in. So and you it, become yeah. what people want you to be. You act you become, the way yeah. you think you should, whatever is acceptable, whatever they need. But yeah. inside, you're not that person. Right. Yes. And it yeah. becomes... And, but you don't even know who that person is anymore. Yeah. At all. And, and it's either you become what they want in order to keep them happy or to keep them from further abusing you or hurting you. You just know there's a lot of pain when you step outside of the bounds of being this imagery. And if there's anything going on in the background, like you talk about the hiddenness, 
you're going, I, I, there's no way I'm going to bring this guy out, this guy that has porn addictions or sex addictions or whatever to the surface or whatever the other thing is, but we're talking about sexuality. There's no way I'm going to bring that to the surface to even attempt to get any healing to it because it is only going to equal more pain and punishment. Well, yeah, and I'm not letting anybody in, in the shack. There's no way because I'm, I'm terrified of seeing the look of disgust on their face, yeah. right. you know, which is the, the look that I'm so familiar with when I, when I look in the mirror myself. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, we perform. And, and here's an interesting thing. Um, lying is not about duplicity. Lying is not about fooling people as much as it is about staying safe. Right. Mm. The protection. The right? It's a survival yeah. mechanism. Yep. And, and you see it. You see it in little children. They already start shading the truth because in some way they think that there's a threat. Yep. Yeah. And it's safer to to try to shade the truth than to be authentic, you mm-hmm. know. And um, and it's it's so wound into the brokenness of our humanity. It's so deep. And, and a lot of us feel intense shame about the fact that we're not truth tellers. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm saying, look. Yeah, lying was a survival skill. I mean, yeah. it kept us uh, away from certain kinds of abuse and and did protect us. Mm-hmm. But but even even trying to live up to people's expectations wasn't to ultimately deceive them. You're just hoping no. that maybe maybe you can perform your way into being acceptable. Well, right. w- w- I, when I was in uh, counseling for my PTSD, one of the things as we tapped into that inner child who was so shattered. I heard this voice inside just screaming, just tell me what you want. Tell me what you want and I'll do it for you. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And then just leave me alone. And I said it out loud to my counselor and I just break down mm-hmm. scream crying with the ache of that, that little boy who is like, whatever you want. If it's a lie, if it's a way you want me to manage myself, just yep. I just need you to be happy so I don't have to experience one more moment of disgust or pain like you're talking about. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Justin. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, with my dad, I yelled, I'll be good over and over and Mm -hmm. over and over, right? Mm -hmm. And just just give me another chance. Well, uh, you know, I transferred all that to God, right? Just, I'll be good, just give me another chance. Yeah. And and then you you, you go in that cycle of continuously fail. (laughs) Totally, I'll be good, and then you fail again. Yeah, and so it just, you know, after a while, you're just going like, it's true. You know, I'm just, I am just worthless. Yeah. And, mm. and here's, here's the really bad thing is that the whispers have all been there through your experiences and all that. And then, you know, you go into the holy place, the church or whatever, mm-hmm. and then they tell you that God feels the same way. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so now I'm alone. Like, mm. you know, abandoned. it's like, oh, and thankfully, you know, there was a sense that Jesus was someone who, who wouldn't just leave, mm. you know. And um, and Jesus was the first person who never left for me, even mm. as a child. Mm. And um, but there was this real sense of separation. But you know, it was God the Father who couldn't look on sin. It was God the Father who needed a sacrifice. It was God the Father who needed to be appeased. Mm. It was God the Father who was the judge in the courtroom, mm. and and I was already guilty. Right. And uh, and so you know, a lot of my theology perpetrated um, a huge amount of abuse. Uh, now, I got great things from my theological background as well. So uh, it's it's a mixed bag. Right. But, you know. Tell me this. So you have all these experiences in, in childhood, and then you also, I'm assuming, you, then you carry that into adultness. And so talk about how you felt about God's feelings about you, and then yeah. ultimately how you began to get out. So, God was very confusing because it it wasn't like God was just the ogre. Right. There were transcendent experiences. There were moments of beauty Mm. that penetrated. There was a piece of music or a sunset or Mm. something that was connected to this beauty of God, which, you know, when you feel like you're just a piece of crap anyway, that that's the truth of your being – then even the beauty of God is an accusation, mm-hmm. right? But it's still something that is transcendent. And, and we now know in science that every human being has a, has a, 
a genetic drive for transcendence. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're going to have to have a God of some sort, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and something that is bigger than yourself. So, you know, we came back to Canada when I was about um, almost 10 years old. So my first decade was basically inside of the, of the world of New Guinea. And, and at, by the time I'm 12, we moved around a lot. I went to um, 13 schools before mm-hmm. I graduated high school. And uh, so, you know, uh, it co- by the time... I was a teenager, I didn't have a misser. I, it was completely mm-hmm. broken, right? I never missed anybody. Yeah, you're just and, independent. Uh, I'm fine on my own. No, not just independent. You're, you're shut down in yeah. terms of any kind of emotional spectrum. You right. know, everything is just a few shades of gray, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so uh, by 12, I'm horribly addicted to porn because, you wow. know, it's, it's the imagination of a relationship without mm-hmm. the risk of a real one, yeah. Yeah. And um, that's probably like your source of intimacy. Well, it was and it, because it was an imagination that somebody didn't see you as just a piece of shit, but it made you feel like one, you know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, it was so, a double edged sword uh-huh. here. Here. Yeah, it is a double edged sword. And here's uh, but you begin to attach your sense of intimacy to that sense of imagination. And mm-hmm. it's not real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So so in our world. Uh, it's it's kind of fascinating to me, you know, and I'm, I've got some theological training and all that kind of stuff. And, and people think that there is, um, that in scripture, there is the use of the word eros for love, for romantic love. That's kind of how they talk about it. Mm-hmm. And it's actually not even used in scripture, eros, because, because wow. it was considered to be an illusion, right? Our, Eros, all the words for sexuality in, the, in scripture are agape. Mm. They're not eros, they're agape, which is other-centered, self-giving love. Mm. Eros was considered by the Greeks to be a demonic god where, where you used your life force to feed on someone else. Oh, wow. wow. So, so the goal was to absolutely, obl- the person, the other, didn't matter at all. Mm. It was, it, so our... Our um, our parallel to that in a modern time would be the difference between real love, other-centered, self-giving love, which is what, who God is, mm. and in, infatuation. See, and and yeah. the distinction the distinction is actually knowing someone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So knowing becomes the basis for real love, but in in infatuation knowing actually destroys the imagination of love mm-hmm. right so it's it's fine when you project on that person your own needs right right whether it's on a piece of paper or on a on a screen right. or somebody you see and then so you know so you you pr- it's really you loving yourself through an object so you have to right. objectify them in one sort or another and what destroys that imagination is to actually get to know right. that they're a, a, a real, a real human, human being, being. Mm-hmm. yes, right. So real love is is really knowing that grows where where infatuation or eros is is actually based on not knowing. It's all about m- yeah. me feeding off of someone. So that is great. It, oh, and it's it's so destructive because you are relating to people in a way that you are not designed to. Yep, That's so right? good to explain because I think. People can get lost in it, and, and because there can be a pull to it, people can think that's what they're wanting, but that's mm-hmm. actually not what they are designed for. Not at all. Not at all. We're designed. Well, here's an interesting verse. And human beings, it says men, but the word in the Greek is anthropos, which just means human beings, right? right. So human beings loved darkness rather than light. What do you think the term loved is? Eros. Right? They, agape. Oh. Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Everything we do is fundamentally agape. It's just so warped. Mm. In oh, terms, you're saying, terms, I see. Okay. So the agape, they actually had an agape love for darkness because it's so warped. Yeah, so they've given themselves to darkness. It's other-centered right. self-giving. So I'm going to give myself away to darkness. But mm. it's still agape. Mm. Right? Wow. 
Eros isn't even used in scripture. Right, because it's right. nowhere in scripture, Eros. Because it's not real. Mm. And <laughs> so, so the perspective is, is that kind of, uh, we still have a capacity for other centered. So even in porn, there is an imagination of other centered self giving this, but it's to darkness. Right, right. Right. Because right? when in light, everything becomes known. Mm -hmm. In right. darkness, everything becomes hidden. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I lose my identity. That person loses their identity. It, mm. It's all hidden. But it's the driving force is still agape. Which is, again, why people feel so alone and abandoned after participating in a lifestyle with pornography. Yeah. Because there's no knowing. There's no being known. There's no knowing someone else in that whole thing. You're left in this deep isolation and darkness. It's an empty imagination. Yeah. But right? it was probably a st I mean like when for you growing up it was probably a stability until you got it seemingly something. felt like something stable or something to go to to medicate on or whatever. Yeah. It was definitely medication, but yeah. it 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 was horrendous. I hated it mm -hmm. and I hated yeah. myself and and um and it was completely a hidden thing. Mm. Yeah. You know, nobody knew. And and I could I could have periods of time where I had some self discipline enough, or or I'd try hard again and take right. a run at this thing, you know, and uh, and I'd get you know fifty yards down the path, or maybe a hundred yards down the path before I'm way off in the weeds somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, and there was just sense of this is this is not going to end. And but he, here's the deal. You don't want to deal with your history. You don't want to deal <laughs> with exposing yourself. So yeah. the promises are all about give me another chance. I'll, I'll start again. Right. Mm -hmm. Make it all better. Right. Let me just look forward and not look back to that past. Yeah, See, exactly. I can do good now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start from today and, and, and give it another shot here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's just inevitable that because self-discipline is, is, is something that comes from the outside in. It's not something that comes from the inside out. No. But why would anything come from the inside out that is good if you're right. just a piece of crap? Right. right? right. If you believe you're worthless trash. Then there's nothing to come out. No. no. Everything that you do that is actually good, you're faking. Mm, if, right. And <laughs> this is that's the problem. This is so important. I want to like rehit what you just said. If you believe there's not like the core of you is worthless or there's nothing. You good are in good. There. You are good. There is nothing good in me. Uh -huh. Right. That terrible. Song. If you That's believe horrible. that, then you can't produce goodness except being fake. Yeah. And, and let me tell you that the Western church has camped on this. They have said that you have a sin nature. They've said that you're mm -hmm. totally depraved. Luther said you are snow covered dung. Right. <laughs> Which, which is shit, right? Because uh -huh. um, the Greek word is shit, and uh -huh. scubala. And, and um, so, like, hopefully, and they created this imputed, called imputed righteousness, that is that, that Jesus is going to wrap you up in his robe of righteousness so he can sneak you into heaven, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and God the Father is going to go, do you smell that? Do you smell that? It smells like shit, you know? <laughs> and, and Jesus is going, you know, propitiation, redemption, you know, spraying the little bottle, so that, <laughs> you know, and, and he sneaks you into heaven. And, and, as, and so, and we were told so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. Mm. Right. And, and it's confusing our union with Christ, with the reality of our cre our creation in yeah. the image and likeness of God. Right. And, and, and separating us from, from that and saying, no, 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 you're fundamentally the truth of your being is that you're worthless. What? Right? Go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, go ahead. What happened? Because I'm, I'm curious, the evolution of that porn, porn addiction for that little boy. And then I want to I hear how, you know, your mindset changed. I want to get into that mm -hmm. and what began yeah. to heal him and stuff. But I want to I hear like the evolution of him. So I and I'll have I have a story to tell you down the road of this conversation just a little bit and um because it's fairly recent um a year ago from this january and um 
as part of this ongoing process of coming to wholeness. Here, I'm, I'm like turning 65 this year, and I, there's still stuff that is coming up from mm. my childhood, you know, and mm. I'm, I'm going to tell you about one of them. Uh, but in terms of I'm 12 years old, 13 years old, we're moving around, I'm trying to figure out how to fit into a Western culture, which doesn't make any sense to me to begin with. Even though I look like I'm supposed to fit, mm. I, I don't know how. And um, so everything's about survival skills and and um, mm. and I can look back now and I can say, boy, you know, the kindness of God planted that person right there, because if it hadn't been for that person that one day or whatever it was, I don't know what would have happened and it right. wouldn't have been good, you know. And so um, so uh, when you're violated sexually as a child, one of the. One of the truths that happens is that you become a person who doesn't have internal boundaries, mm. right? You become hypervigilant. That is, you're, you're aware of your surroundings because safety is everything. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you are – you have this uncanny ability to pick up what the other people's boundaries are because you can't, you can't produce them out of yourself, right. you know, because they're all, they're all wrecked on the inside. So safety becomes – you know, trying to adapt to the boundaries around you. Reading, Problems. reading all their boundaries. Their you're, you're, you're constantly got radar, hypervigilance. Yeah, yep. radar, and um, and one of those great truths that I discovered along my journey was that the underlying reality of my life was shame, and and shame is different than guilt. And that guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I am something wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So so guilt is in the realm of behavior. Shame is in the realm of ontology or the truth of who you are. Mm -hmm. Right. So shame is a direct attack against being made in the image and likeness of God. Right. right. That's why that's why it has no place. But but because my world had shifted everything to behavior is the evidence of who you are, the truth of who you are. What you do is who you are. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So um, so. Everything was focused on behavior. Therefore, shame was identified also with behavior. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, I'm a piece of crap to begin with. So we're not even going to talk about that. We're going to talk about trying to get my behavior to change. Right. right. right? And so I'm, I became very legalistic, very religious. Very, mm -hmm. I'm first born, very performer, um, trying to live up to people's expectations and define myself within that at the same time. Is feeling like I mean, so in Bible school, right? I'm, I'm the h highest performing student in the school. Wow. I'm paying my own way through school wow. by working, and I'm walking at night down railway tracks, screaming into the wind. Mm. Right, and nobody knows. Yeah, mm -hmm. cause you're this. Right? You look like this perfect being that's got everything oh, all no, together. Oh I, no, I, I, I looked, and I could. I could shift conversations to stay pretty good looking, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and that's part of a survival skill too, is where you're able to make the person who makes any kind of an accusation the one who's really at fault, right? right. So you can that's you can spin a conversation back on someone. And one of those, the truth that I was going to get to was that <clears throat> shame destroys your ability to distinguish between a value statement and an observation, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, which is a huge deal. So, I mean, that to to use an illustration, when Kim and I were first married, is and she would say about laundry, you know, don't mix the colors with the whites. I heard her say, "I don't know why I married such a loser of a human being." Right. right. You know, because because I had a thin layer of perfectionist performance, and any observation other than perfection in mm -hmm. terms of performance was an accusation. Yep. Right. So I couldn't distinguish between an observation and an accusation. I was always at risk. And you either what are the there's four F's now. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fun. Yes. Fun. Fun. Uh huh. It's, it's a, a good really one. Good one. Mm -hmm. It is a good one. When he says four F's, we're talking about the four different styles of trauma responses or trigger responses. Fight, flight, fawn or freeze. Yeah. Correct. And this fawn is the, I'm going to do everything I can to please you and make you I'll happy. I'll make a joke. I'll yeah. turn the conversation. I'll apologize. Appease. I'll, I'll find a yeah. way to make everybody feel good again. So that we can, yeah. Right. 
Right, right, right. And so freeze is a common response because you just, if somebody asks you a real question, you you have no response. You just, you know, and it was it was where you went to when the abuse happened a lot of times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, you know, I, I, I performed well and, um, and, and you, part of what saved my life was just the intersection of relationships here and there. And frankly, most of them were, were women who took an interest in this broken boy, although mm-hmm. they never put it in those terms. Mm. So, you know, even when I was in Bible school, the president's, um, the president of the school's wife who, uh, the president and his wife were both missionaries and had been in the Philippines and, and, um, but she, they, she kind of collected broken, broken boys. Mm. And, uh, and so she'd slip me a note or slip me a book or, you know, mm. do these little kind of things along the way. And, and that was one of those threads that, that kept me alive. Mm. Where and, she saw uh, past that exterior, she could see the reality of what was there and yeah. at some level. Uh, you know, in some senses, I don't think she knew how to reach into that space. Yeah. Uh, but she was aware of it and she was very gifted in terms of of feeding things that were living yeah. in, into those dead places, yeah. you know, and uh, just sparking stuff. And, and so, you know, I had people like that, but... Um, you know, I, w- I was on the run. I, of course, I couched it in all kinds of great religious language, like, you know, you know, I don't think I'll ever get married because, because you know, I want to be fully available to do the work of God, you know, that kind of, you uh-huh. know. And, and, and I don't run away from relationships. I just hear God call me somewhere else. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's such a bull. And um, so, you know, if, if you were to ask somebody, who was around me all those years and said, what do you think of Paul? They would have said probably, well, he's, he's smart. Um, he's a good guy. There's just something off, you know, <laughs> or, or he, can, he can really shred someone with a smile, right? Mm-hmm. He can use language really well. Mm-hmm. And, and and it turned, you know, I never thought I was actually creative or intelligent. I just thought I fooled people well. Mm. Yeah. And so also shame speaking, yeah. Right. Which is, again, like a lot of the people listening in the issue of like brokenness inside of sexuality, what you're really saying is this is what a lot of us do when we have broken places and experiences in our sexuality is we put on these masks, we morph ourselves, we control environments to hide the thing that we are, that we are so disgusted with, or we think that the world is so disgusted with. We're terrified of it being, uh, found, being out. found out. And I yeah. know that in your journey, even with that, like your porn addiction continued on into... Oh. Right, um, drug it right into marriage. Drug it right into marriage, and it was hiding in the background. And even Which there was so many people believe when I get married, it will disappear. Mm-hmm. But obviously, well, it'll just all be better. It'll just disappear well, overnight. You know, because I I drug in all the brokenness. Yeah, none of the broken places were healed. Yeah. No. So you know, but but we think we can find some kind of an external mechanism, environment, something on the outside that will then fix it's what's the broken inside. on the inside. Because I wanted God to heal me, but I didn't want anybody else to find out about it. Right. right. You wanted it to be a secret healing. Yeah, like secret healing, a miraculous, instantaneous healing. Yeah. You know? Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but what yeah. actually? Can you describe what the healing process tangibly looked like in for your life? Yeah, for, especially that, for sexuality yeah. and that. One is I had to become exposed, right? Mm-hmm. Right, and and this is the tough thing. It's like the work of the Holy Spirit in the world is to expose it of its brokenness. That's what the Greek word is to expose, mm-hmm. convict. But the word in the Greek is to expose. And and if you have a God who's mean and angry, and that's a scary ex- word. It's ex- it's scary because exposure is intended to humiliate you because yes. that's what's. That's what's happened when you got caught, you know. Right. You've been exposed this, and humiliated. You've been exposed and absolutely humiliated. Yeah. And um, and and now I know different, but but the work of the whole without without exposure, healing's not possible. So right? good, the, Paul. The reason that the Holy Spirit exposes you is mm-hmm. to heal you. Mm-hmm. Because what is kept in secret 
you guard closely, you know, yeah. and and it's like, oh, my gosh, the risk involved in that just mm-hmm. seems insurmountable. And yet the addiction itself will drive you in the direction of exposure yeah. anyway. Yes. You know? Yeah. And so what what someone may be meant for evil, what you meant for evil, God then is the redeeming genius inside. And the very thing that was exposed then becomes a place that healing is possible. Mm-hmm. Now, you can run away into suicide, which was always an option for me. Right. You know, and, um, and which is, I, it's, it's the last way to run away before you have to face yourself, right? It's, or right. hitting the bottom. Hitting the bottom is when you actually face yourself, when you actually right. take a stand somewhere. But suicide becomes the last way to run away for, for a bunch of us. And yeah. it was for me. Um, so I got married. I got married not because I, was, I knew how to love Kim, but I really th- thought that God was saying, you need to do this. And in retrospect, not fair to Kim, but save my life. Right. Right. right? I mean, completely not fair to Kim. Right. Um, because she thought, I mean, I was such a good performer. I got, and she's got a good crap detector, and so yeah, does her mom, does. you know, yeah, and her uh-huh. sisters. And she and her five sisters, she had five sisters and two brothers, and her and her five sisters, as you know, are called the force. Mm-hmm. And may the force be with you. And I got <laughs> past their crap detectors. And you know, part of it is that buried inside all of the, garbage was a real person yeah Yeah. right so it's not cut and dried like oh you know because it's fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so it's a it's a mixed bag but right but it's so intertwined that you don't know what is actually real and what is not real yeah and and so um but i i read the books you know this is part of being intelligent it turns out that I'm actually smart, and but it, it empowered my ability to hide, yeah. and and it it gave me a false sense of authenticity, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and in the West, in the West, a lot of us um, hide inside of our intellectuality, yeah, mm-hmm. and um, and and that's where you know we go up and live in our minds. That's why porn is up there. Right. right. Yeah. It's, it's all about imagination and stuff. And and when when Versus somebody is living in your like in your heart and spirit or in your the fullness of your being, including your mind. Of, yeah. Right. Including right. Your all mind. of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So there the, without an integration between the heart and the head, there's a gap that something has to fill yeah. in right. terms of humanity and porn is one of the things that just slides in there um, because it's imagination of authentic relationship. Right. And um and yeah. so, well, you ended up in the exposure with Kim where she ended yeah, up. Yeah, I committed adultery. Yeah. Fully committed she adultery. Caught, she caught me in um, a three month affair with one of her best friends. And this is, this is well into our marriage. I mean, Matthew, our sixth child, had been born. So, and it's, it's well into the marriage. And, and, and now, when you look back, would you say that exposure was one of the best things that's ever happened to you? One of the horriblest, terriblest, <laughs> most worstest, <laughs> worstest days of, and times and experiences of my life, and I'm grateful for that exposure every day because without it, I couldn't be having this conversation. I'd most likely be dead. Kim and I would not be together. Yeah. My kids would have been so damaged, uh, more so than what they already experienced by that whole journey. So I'm, you know, never want to go through that again, but I'm grateful every day for it, you know? Yeah. So, um, dang. And, and, and not dang because um, I don't like the emotions of I'm grateful for every tear because that's one thing that my dad beat out of me. And so it's part of the healing process, you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, it takes Kim and I then 11 years to heal. You know, 11 years before we're reconciled. Yeah. Which and, I think is so important just to mention. I want to highlight what you're yeah. saying is 
that healing processes are not instantaneous. They People oh. want them to be. They want to get over it in a year. Like, oh, this is already years gone by. Are we done with this? Can we move forward? Yeah, and, you have six weeks to grieve, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah. And really what it does in wanting to expedite uh, the healing process, you're really saying that you are wanting to obliterate your humanity and the humanity of those people involved because you want to crush out the reality of humanity and make it not exist and make almost yourself and other people like robots that simply can be reprogrammed overnight. Yeah, no. You know, we'd love a, we'd love a red or a blue pill, right? Yes. Yes. Or, or extreme soul makeover is my favorite. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Like just send me to Disney World and fix me by the time I got back. And um, But we're too incredibly and beautifully crafted as human beings for quick fixes. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, and the, and the kind of damage is unique to the individual. And, and because you can put, we have four kids in our family and the boys, three boys and a, and a girl, my sister, Debbie, and, and the three boys experienced, you know, some of the, the physical abuse from my dad. Mm. And, um, and one day I, Debbie's mad at me about something. This is in, you know, 10 years ago and and she says you don't even see me do you and we start having a conversation about that and and she said i saw what dad did to you mm. wow he never touched me i wasn't even worth touching mm. oh so you can see that how debbie perceived that situation as a child as well at least they're being touched right right you know? the abuse and, is and better I'm than just neglect invisible. Mm-hmm. correct Correct, you know. Yeah. So, so, and that was still playing out ten years ago, right? Right. And uh, and so the, to me, I look at the healing journey sort of like a spiral that goes deeper and deeper down into the soul, and I that's a positive thing. Yeah. And 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 I and I now believe that you never go around in circles. That mm. that the Holy Spirit is involved inside and submitting to your willingness to engage the process, yeah, mm. right? This is a God who submits by nature. You're not on God's timetable here. Right. God's on yours. Yep, yep. And, and that is, it just seems so unlikely the way that God was portrayed to us. Yeah. But you start looking everywhere, even the Trinity itself and themselves is a, is a mutuality of submission. You know, mm-hmm. father to the son, the son to the father, the spirit to the father, you know, and mm-hmm. and they they coin this term, which is implicitly driven into sexuality. Um, and it took them a few hundred years after, you know, the resurrection. And they finally came up with a term called perichoresis, which means fundamentally the mutual interpenetration of one with the other without the loss of personhood. And mm-hmm. that was to describe the reality of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, unity and diversity in the community of the Trinity, as Robbie Zacharias would say. Mm. And 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 so you've got this mutual interpenetration. This is why sexuality and eternal life are so connected, because they both revolve around the word knowing. Mm. To, to really know, this is eternal life, that you know the one, you know him, God mm-hmm. the Father, and the one who God sent. Yeah, mm-hmm. who is Jesus, right? That you know. So... So real eternal life is contingent upon this growing knowing. Huh? Mm-hmm. And we're, we're back to that. But knowing was always the, the word that was used for the sexual intimacy of In marriage. In the Bible, yeah. Right. Yep, yep, yep. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's wedded together. And this is why the movement toward authenticity is the movement toward everything. Mm-hmm. Right, because the like, movement towards like, authenticity is is the whole idea of now I'm actually getting to be known. I'm yeah. knowing, and we're coming out of the hiddenness, out of the dark, darkness in authenticity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So when you're going around this circle, it feels like you're going around in a circle, right. but right. you're actually in a spiral. Yes. Right? <laughs> and so there are no two days in which you are the same human being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The experiences that you've had yesterday now – create the sound you are today and the holy spirit continues to work with the sound you are and who you are to bring out the clarity of that sound and the redeeming genius of god is that 
There is no negation of your history. Right. There is a wrapping of your history into the sound that you become. Mm. And and so you you there's no not a divine plan here that you're failing to live up to. Right. It's it's an artistic presence of of creation, Father, Son and Holy Spirit who are in the middle of you beginning to unwind the damage and restoring you mm. while redeeming the losses at the same time, mm-hmm. which is like right. mind-blowing. Which, yeah. which, which is where so many people, again, are terrified to go into their history, to start to look, where did this all come from? The parts of me that feel so shattered now, they're so terrified to go back there. But in order to get this healing, like you're saying, we have to be willing to revisit our history, ultimately yeah. with that love that wants to go sit down in the middle of it and begin to take an honest look and begin to redeem those things that happen exactly. in that space. So part of my process was pulling the yellow pages off the shelf and and dialing a number, you know, because I'm evangelical, modern evangelical. So therapists at that time were considered borderline <laughs> demonic, you know, uh-huh. and uh, and but it was like, if I can't find a way to change, I am not going to take the risk of hurting anybody like this again. Mm-hmm. Mm. What? There was something in you that finally was like the risk of being known and working through my stuff is less than the risk of staying the same. Yeah. Like it finally and, yeah. switched because before it was the risk of being known is too great. And now yeah. it was the risk of staying the same is too great. And I And and what was required is the loss of the facade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's what was the point of the switch for me. There was no place to hide. Mm-hmm. Now some of us don't have to get to that place. <laughs> right. right. Please some if you're listening, <laughs> you don't have to go that far. Yeah, you don't have to wait until it's either get help or die, right? you know, which was really my options. Um, and, and, but there are some of us who are so hidden, so broken, and so buried under the weight of the lies and the accusations that have come from everywhere, including our own soul, that we have to get caught. Right. I mean, there's just, that's our redemption, it, it, the exposure uh, of our lives, and it's cataclysmic. You know, for some people, their transformation is a work of art. That is, it's 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 the designer who is removing the stains from the fabric, one thread at a time. It's the the artist master mind who is taking off the layers of false paint to reveal the glory of the uh, of the and the magnificence of the artwork underneath right mm-hmm. some of us need a bulldozer who comes <laughs> crashing through the walls and, and 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 blowing up everything down to the foundation so that you can actually rebuild a house from scratch on the foundations that have now been healed yeah well and yeah so different experiences for different people in terms of process and one of the things i've heard you say so many times is the wrath of your wife was the love of god for you absolutely and i know that's one yeah go ahead i know well i know a lot of spouses maybe when it comes to affairs or stuff like that sweep that stuff or porn or whatever it's just sweep everything under the rug and act like all right we're gonna let it go I need to just be nice and love them and forgive them and move on. And that actually isn't really love. And it doesn't sound like, especially for you, if Kim had just been like, all right, well, it's forgiven. Let's, let's try this again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no. And this is one of the reasons I think that God in, in God's great wisdom and kindness moved our lives together. You know, Mm. on the one hand, not totally not fair to Kim. Right. And, um, and but on the other hand, I I didn't need a mild, submissive Christian woman. That's the last thing I needed in my life. Uh-huh. And uh, I needed the force. I needed the wrath of God. I needed, uh, you know. And so I and I tell people this: part of the reason I am as healthy as I am today, and and where there's such a congruency in my life between my inside world and my outside world, is the intensity of Kim's fury. Mm. You know, it did take us 11 years to reconcile. Yeah. And and that's a miracle that I thought in the first few years, I thought it will never happen. So so the reason that I went to therapy and the reason that I started working on my stuff and began to see changes, right? 
Kim didn't believe any of them. No. Mm -hmm. You know? And so when I would call from the therapist's office and say, this is what we worked on today, she'd say, yeah, right, whatever. (laughs) You know? Right. You weren't doing it to win her. There, that's the point. I I did not go to therapy to fix my marriage. Mm -hmm. I did not go to therapy to, um, to, to fix Kim. Yeah. Which we meet with so many people that the, the spouse goes to appease the other spouse, but transformation doesn't happen when you're doing it for someone else. And then you start to become resentful if that person doesn't like if if you were going for Kim, you would have had to resent her when she didn't. Well, it's based on resentment's always based on an expectation unfulfilled, right? right? Uh, it's the same as a disappointment, and uh, yeah. So you, if you have an expectation that your spouse is going to change, right? By you, you know? I'm going to work through yeah. my stuff so you will be different. Yeah. How come you're not changing, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's like. I have these conversations with guys who are talking to me about their sexual intimacy and the diminishment of it in their marriages, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're starting to they're starting to stray. They're starting to look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. They're starting to engage with in other things. And I and I say, okay, well, let me ask you a question. What if your wife was in an accident and she couldn't participate in any sexual intimacy at oh. all? And they go, well, I would take care of her. And then they go, ah, oh, shit. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, oh, this is really all about me, isn't uh-huh. it? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 This is not about living inside the grace of a day, inside the presence of a God who is going to dwell in you to love that person in an other centered, self giving yeah. way. This is really about Eros. This is really about me. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I went to find a way to change, and it was a razor's edge, mm. right? If, if I couldn't find a way to change, I'm out of here because yeah. I, I could not ever again face the kind of devastation that I perpetrated, hmm. you know, and, and, and part of it was the first day when, when Kim caught me and she called me on the phone and I was at a lunch thing with a friend of mine, Stephen Anderson, and uh, said, you know, I'm waiting for you at your office and I know. And in that moment, I it you, was it you was, knew was she all, knew yep yep that was the crisis right there Man. and the quest the question right then is are you going to face her or are you going to kill yourself yeah mm. because I mean, that it's was, devastating that having to walk through that door and have that conversation the door you've been avoiding no, your knowing whole life. the cost it's about to yeah. cost you not only the pain and suffering of all the people involved but yeah. also having to dig into all the biggest weightiest heaviest things yeah and and at the same time, for those of you who have found yourself there, you know that there is finally this release, relief. this relief that, my gosh, the lies that I've mm-hmm. had to perpetrate even on myself have taken so much energy. I yeah. have nothing left. So so I drive across town. I have no memory of driving across town. I mean, it's just an absolute blank for me. And I drive into the parking lot, drive in. Kim's already physically disrupted my entire office. <laughs> like, she she is she is the wrath of God, you know. And uh and and she took it apart and and we start a four hour monologue on her part. Wow. Right? That's a long and, monologue. And everything about shame drives you to hiding. So even when you can't look off off the floor. Right. That's trying to find a place to hide, you know. Mm-hmm. And um And at the end of four hours, I said to her, if we are going to do this, because at that point, I'm not running away to anybody else. I'm not running away from this. The only place that's else than this that I'm willing to to have an option for is is suicide. That's it. Right. Right. And I said, if we're going to do this, I need to tell you every secret that I have. Mm. Which is so important. I mean, I think oh, that literally God. changed the game for your healing process. Yeah. Yeah. But here's here's the brutality of it. She naively says, bring it on. And so I begin to unfold it. And she asks her questions, very specific questions about everything. And that by the end of that night, because it was like four o'clock in the afternoon when I got to my office. But by midnight that night or whatever it was i'm done and i said that's everything that's all wow and during the night the holy spirit climbs into my world and says 
that's not everything. And in the morning, I have to say, that wasn't everything. Mm. I did that. I did that three times in a row. No. Wow. I did. And, and by the fourth day, she was destroyed. Yeah. And she said, I will never believe another word that comes out of your mouth the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. The only reason she let me even stay in the house was she absolutely, besides, in spite of all of her fury, she believed I was owning it. I never like pointed a finger at her. Mm-hmm. If, I'd have, if I'd have tried to blame shift, which oh, I'd yep. never even crossed my mind, but no. if I'd have tried to, uh, some of out. this is your stuff, you know, if I'd have done that thing, mm-hmm. we would not be married today. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it would have just, that was, but it, it didn't even cross my mind because I had hit the bottom. And when you, you hit the bottom, you own it. Yeah, it's like, my issue. Yep. I can't hide. Where am I going to go to hide, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, so that was in, that was in 94. January 4th, 1994, that started an 11 year journey, mm-hmm. right? So here we are, all these years later, and a year ago, a piece of this, you know, one of my earliest memories, and, and, and Jesus says, we got it, and I'm in Australia, and I have this dream during the night, I'm in the liminal state, you know, between dreaming and waking yeah. and all that stuff, and, and Jesus says, we need to go back and, and visit that memory. And I'm like, what? I mean, I I dealt with this like years ago, right? And um, we need to go back. And it was um, when I was uh, probably five, six, maybe uh, five, probably more five. Um, the first real house that we had on the mission field was made out of aluminum that was bolted together on wood frame. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all aluminum. So my safest place in my whole world was during a monsoon rainstorm because I couldn't hear my dad. Wow. And, oh. and uh, yeah. so, um, so this memory is uh, the Donny boys had found a way. Uh, either they had unloosened the bolts or whatever, but they had found a way to watch my parents having sex. Right. Mm. And so that they took me down there. Oh gosh, it's so through traumatizing. The, through the little holes, yeah. Mm. Um, we watched my parents have sex, and and so Jesus says to me, "We've got to go back and visit that." And I'm like, "I can't." And and Jesus says to me, "Now you have to understand. This is inside. This is in my imagination. This is in." This is an encounter. I've never heard God speak audibly, but I, I know the voice very well. Mm. And it was, I would never ask you to go anywhere where I'm not with you. Yeah. Mm. So I said, okay. So we go down to the place and, and I'm looking and I see the holes, you know. And I say to Jesus, I can't look through them. And he says, oh, I, I didn't bring you here to look through them. Mm. Here's what I want. I brought you here to see me stand in front of them. Mm. Wow. And I buried my face in his chest and I just began to sob. And and suddenly it drops. This was the first tribal experience of sexual abuse. This looking Mm. through little holes and watching intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, from a distance, yeah. All the porn stuff just flip through the album just like bam 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 wow. that's that's what you've been that's what you did your whole life yeah. is wow. trying to find in, intimacy through these little holes that you could look through mm. and and so i mean this is on a sunday morning and i'm speaking that morning yeah so i i walk in there and i just tell everybody what i've just been through oh my gosh it it was to let people into that journey and process. I mean, mm-hmm. in one day, I was able to to work through something that had been sitting there waiting for me to get to a place mm. where finally it was time. You don't have to go looking for stuff. <laughs> to uh-huh. eat, it will right? come. <laughs> it will come. And, it, and, and you want it to come in the timing of the Holy Spirit. You don't want it to come in some kind of you know, plan that you have for dealing with your stuff. And that's part of the mystery. Only you don't know yourself well enough to know how how to unwind the damage in your own heart. 
mm-hmm. in a way that doesn't just damage you further, you know. Right. And and I and I think partly all these modalities of healing, you know, all the different ways, the listening prayers and all these these are all brought to the surface by the Holy Spirit because of the uniqueness of the human being. There's no quick fix and single solution for anybody. Mm-hmm. This is this is about walking it out, you know, and working it out. And, you know, I, I can look back and say this. One of the best things that I did, a couple of the best things that I did. One is I went and got help. And mm-hmm. I, I paid for somebody to be trustworthy because I didn't know anybody could be. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's yeah. why a therapist was really helpful. And mm-hmm. and I pulled a name out of the yellow pages that turned out to be the perfect person on the planet mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. Right. And the second thing I did is that I faced it. We never made my adultery the new secret. Yeah. Love right. That. And and there is nothing that Kim didn't know by as we worked through this. Wow. Mm-hmm. And 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 I let I began to trust the Holy Spirit in her because why would I ever think that I could heal anybody else? I couldn't yeah. even heal myself. Right. You know? And so that was not my job. And and so, you know, I, I didn't need to make sure she was okay. Mm. And and I and she would tell you that one of the ways that she was okay is that she has a friend, a best friend who walked with her mm-hmm. every day, two years, you know, while she cussed and screamed a lot. And yeah. Mm-hmm. And didn't come, didn't come back to the house and kill me, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and and never in two years did her friend ever say, "You need to get past this." Yeah, you know, just walked with her, mm. you know. And so our our paths were in in very different directions, and and Kim and I are now the best we have ever been. I mean, mm-hmm. here we are in the middle of all this COVID stuff, you know, and quarantined together. <laughs> And it's precious. It's sweet. Mm. And we, you know, we really like each other. And and part of reconciliation, and the reason it took eleven years, is because it took that long for to earn back her trust, which is the most precious gift she could ever give anybody. Yeah. Mm. Right. And this is the beauty of God. God will take however long it takes. Mm-hmm. To earn your trust, mm. because it's the most precious gift you could give to to God. That's yeah. so good, Paul. I really mm. like that. I know that we have to uh, uh, respect your time and, Thank you. and and wrap things up and let you go. And we so appreciate you coming and participating in this. Um, is there any final things that you want to say to people who feel you know stuck or hopeless? What would you say to them? Well, one is you've got to let somebody in. Mm. Yeah, you know, you, even if you can't trust uh, an invisible God, you need God with skin on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. And so, you know, we're not designed to work our way through this. All we'll end up with is some form of self-referential incoherence. Yeah. You know, we've, we've got to let somebody in. And, and it's risky, mm-hmm. granted. And, and it's not them being perfect. It's yeah. them being present, mm. you know. And so, if you've got nobody, I mean, pay for somebody. Totally. You know? or, or ask God for somebody. Mm-hmm. But but you you know you've got to let somebody into that journey, and then no more secrets. I mean, just stop, you know, and 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 ask the questions, all of them, the theological questions, the questions about God. I mean, God loves questions. And one other thing, if you were a person, let's say I'm listening on the other side, and I, I, this isn't like these aren't my problems that I'm having but I have a friend who is experiencing these problems. What's one way that I could support that person that's going through that journey? You can, you can do what, um, what Scott Klausner, um, who's my best friend, what Scott said to me one time. And he's the first person who ever said it, and it should have been my dad. Hmm. And, um, and it was, it was, I met him after um, the adultery and everything else. He became one of the men I began to let into my life, mm. which was a huge deal. And we're driving along, and he says to me, Paul, I want you to know something. I don't care how badly you screw up your life, I'm not leaving. Mm-hmm. And if nothing else, you can say that to your friend. I'm, I don't know how to fix anything, but I'm not leaving. Yeah. And um, it's presence. It's presence that changes everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
Yeah, I think that sometimes it's easier than people make it out. Like you don't have to have the right answer. You don't have to have this perfect thing. Um, and we talk about this attunement being with and feeling like someone is with you is actually how your brain goes through the pain process. Yeah. And that is the most beautiful gift we have. And that is what God came to be on, yeah. like present with us. Mm-hmm. Fear not. I am with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and just to wrap up the 11 years so powerfully transformed you. This journey forced you to ask God the questions like you said, which led you to writing the shack about this beautiful relationship you found that actually hitting rock bottom engaged you to drop from your head knowledge about God to actually having real relationship. And from watching your life from the outside, I would say the beauty of redemption in your life has so been contagious and increased so much from that point of letting losing everything and then choosing in with that journey. And so I know you have to go. We are so thankful having you here with us. Thank you so much. What an honor. I love you both very, very much. We love you. you. Thanks for being part of our life, Paul. Ah, honored. What a joy. Two way street and all that. Yeah. (laughs) All right, bud. Bye now. Bye now. Bye now.